Hello and welcome to another episode of Course Correction. Pride Month is behind us and for some, all of that joy, validation, and affirmation goes with it. It's very easy to forget how many allies you have around you without a constant reminder because it's a lot easier to see the ever-present danger around us. If you had asked me one month ago if Wenatchee Pride would have attracted 4,000 people, I would have laughed, sighed, and said, one day. But that day came a heck of a lot sooner than we expected. Knowing and seeing as many allies, comrades, and community in one place was a revelation. I had more than one person cry happy tears when they hugged me. For many who came, it was their first pride out of the closet. Some came out at the festival because they were awestruck at such a huge, supportive community, and they felt safe. It was such a fantastic celebration of people, and I was truly honored to help bring it to life with my fellow Wenatchee Pride board members. Of course, there are plenty who would love to detract from that. And they use dog whistles to do it. What's a dog whistle, Stella? You may be wondering. Some of you have heard the word, but may not understand what it means. Like virtue signaling. It's common to hear, but the origins and what it truly means is a bit obscure. A literal ultrasonic dog whistle, as some of you may know, is a tool used to train dogs to respond to a specific tone that can't be heard by humans. In the exact same sense, a figurative dog whistle, when speaking of phrases, gestures, or in media, is used as a seemingly innocuous way of being racist, homophobic, transphobic, xenophobic, and pretty much anything phobic. It's used to train others to do the same while remaining somewhat undetected by those that would object to overt bigotry. This is most often used in politics to promote something or stoke fear of intersectional minorities without provoking a defense. Very rarely, usually in the cases of children who don't understand what they are repeating, are people unaware of what they are participating in. However, because of the rare example where someone may not understand or fully comprehend, it creates a layer of plausible deniability and the ability to disavow afterwards. I'll say it more directly. People using these terms know what they are saying more often than not. They are relying on layers of verbal obfuscation to keep from appearing to hold the positions they very clearly hold. You've all heard it before. How was I supposed to know that's offensive? You're too sensitive. Well, I saw it on Fox News, Newsmax, and OAN, so... These are gaslighting techniques to avoid social accountability and promote confusion. The first trackable and provable literal dog whistle and its unironic roots may surprise you. The dude that invented the ultrasonic dog whistle, Francis Galton, also invented the word eugenics and wrote an entire book about how black people would never be as smart or outperform white people in intelligence and achievement. The history of the dog whistle also gets worse as they were used to train dogs not to just hunt birds and foxes, but escaped slaves as well. Sliding into the figurative dog whistle, the first and probably the most infamous example and unintended public explanation of using dog whistles was provided by Lee Atwater in 1981. Atwater is well known as the leader for dirty politics in the Republican Party until his death at 40 years old in 1991. In an unpublished and unfinished autobiography found in his home years after his death, he spoke of winning in politics at all costs. 
without a care to the actual governing of the position. To him, it was about obtaining power and not caring for the people for whom the system of government actually put them there. This makes a lot more sense as we see people like Trump, Matt Shea, Marjorie Taylor Greene, Loan Boebert, Lauren Culp, and so many others rise to power or make the attempt using Atwater's tactics. They care more about holding a position of power than actually working for their constituents. One of the tactics Atwater was most known for was the idea of rebranding a talking point that had become unpopular in order to obscure the fact that the intent of the policy plan had not actually changed. Like segregation and blocking Black people from gaining any advancement in society. This later became known as a dog whistle because only people on the inside knew that the policies they were trying to pass had not actually changed. For example, while Atwater was working for Ronald Reagan in 1981, he was recorded revealing what is now referred to as the Southern strategy. Here's how I would approach that issue as a, as a, as a statistician or a political scientist, or no, as a psychologist, which I'm not, is, is how abstract you, you handle the race thing. In other words, you start out, in, and now y'all are quoting me. It's hard. I won't do that. You start out in 1954 by saying, nigger, nigger, nigger. By 1968, you can't say anything, well, that hurts your backfire, so you say stuff like uh, force busing, states' rights, and all that stuff. And you're getting so abstract now, you're talking about cutting taxes, and all of these things you're talking about are totally economic things, and the byproduct of them is blacks get hurt worse than white. And subconsciously, maybe that is part of it. I'm not saying that, but I'm saying... That if it is getting that abstract and that coded, uh, that, that we're, we're doing away with the racial problem one way or the other. Uh, you follow me? Because obviously sitting around saying uh, we want to cut taxes, we want to cut this, and we want is much more abstract than, than even the busing thing. Uh, and a hell of a lot more abstract than you know. So I, any way you look at it, race is coming on the back burner. Did you catch that? Atwater admits that coming up with a term that is very obviously negative, like forced busing, means that whether or not someone would understand what it was, they are already against it. Because no one wants to be forced, right? But what they don't want to say is, we want to keep black children out of our schools, even though that's what they mean. This is why it's really important to pay attention to the words people use. If someone uses excessively negative or positive terminology to describe a serious topic, then they're probably trying to rebrand it and obscure what the actual issue is long enough to get the policy passed. We now know that the term forced busing was used to cast the desegregation of the South schools in a bad light. Now, there might have actually been some logistical issues that caused problems, but that wasn't the focus of the dog whistle. It was an easy slogan to get the white people upset that black children were being bussed into their school districts. Atwater's recording was one of the first documented explanations of using a dog whistle and also using the phrase states' rights as an official dog whistle term that even today prevails in its racist and bigoted history. The fact that states' rights was used in the same explanation as the N-word should make it obvious. But the power of the dog whistle is the ability to disavow. Atwater worked for a few presidents before he died, one of them being George H.W. Bush, where he deliberately stoked white fear of Black people. During the 1988 presidential campaign, Atwater painted Bush's opponent as soft on crime by producing an ad campaign highlighting a story about Willie Horton, a convicted black man serving a life sentence for murder. Horton had applied for and been granted weekend passes to leave jail. During one of these furloughs, he failed to return to jail. Ten months later, he was still on the run and had committed 
more violent assault crimes in other states before he was recaptured. They used this story as a reason why Bush's opponent was soft on crime, ignoring the fact that nearly every other state had the same furlough program, including Bush's home state of Texas, of which Bush had been the U.S. House representative. Now, while the crimes were real and factual, they'd used a face they knew would truly promote fear in white communities, a black one. Bush and Dukakis on crime. Bush supports the death penalty for first-degree murderers. Dukakis not only opposes the death penalty, he allowed first-degree murderers to have weekend passes from prison. One was Willie Horton, who murdered a boy in a robbery, stabbing him 19 times. Despite a life sentence, Horton received 10 weekend passes from prison. Horton fled, kidnapped a young couple, stabbing the man and repeatedly raping his girlfriend. Weekend prison passes. Dukakis on crime. Never mind. There were probably white people who had committed the near identical crime at the time in one of the other 40 states that furloughed thousands of people each year on the same program. Like a more recent example, Freddie Johnston, who was convicted of murder in Arkansas in 2019 and released on furlough only to sexually assault a minor. But this is probably the first time you've heard Freddie's name. They chose Horton for his face because they knew that it would scare white people into voting. And in 1988, that was more important than appealing to voters of color, not just because of who their base was and is, but also because people of color still have more barriers to vote than white people. Thanks to people like Atwater. People like Atwater and the people they work for today continue to make laws that in the byproduct of the mayor, blacks get hurt worse than white. Because they use dog whistles, as Atwater said himself. This, of course, was the springboard to an era of Republican law and order, tough on crime, dog whistle slogans, which are still used today. This dog whistle was not limited to Republican campaigns, however, and were also championed in the 90s by Democrats whom some would argue went even farther by building on the fear and labeling black people as, quote, super predators. The fourth challenge is to take back our streets from crime, gangs, and drugs. And we have actually been making progress on this count as a nation because of what local law enforcement officials are doing, because of what citizens and neighborhood patrols are doing. We're making some progress. Much of it is related to the initiative called community policing, because we have finally gotten more police officers on the street. That was one of the goals that the president had when he pushed the crime bill that was passed in 1994. He promised 100,000 police. We're moving in that direction, but we can see it already makes a difference. Because if we have more police interacting with people, having them on the streets, we can prevent crimes. We can prevent petty crimes from turning into something worse. But we also have to have an organized effort against gangs, just as in a previous generation, we had an organized effort against the mob. We need to take these people on. They are often connected to big drug cartels. They are not just gangs of kids anymore. They are often the kinds of kids that are called super predators. No conscience, no empathy. We can talk about why they ended up that way, but first we have to bring them to heel. And the president has asked the FBI to launch a very concerted effort against gangs everywhere. In fact, the 1994 crime bill, championed by then President Bill Clinton and written by then Senator Joe Biden, used these exact dog whistles to pass it. This crime bill directly contributed to the mass incarceration crisis we are suffering today that disproportionately targeted black and brown people. 30 years later, we are still feeling the fallout. So dog whistles are not limited to one party or the other. They are also not limited to verbal cues. They can also be hand gestures, pictures, flags, and tattoos. There are entire databases dedicated to identifying new and emerging dog whistles and symbols of hate. One of the more recent hand gestures to make it into the database is the OK symbol. 
which started as a two-handed sign making the same gesture. One hand facing out, so the fingers make a W, and the other facing down, so the fingers make a P, standing for white power. Soon, the P was dropped because it was too blatant for a dog whistle. Because remember, in order to fly under the radar, you need to be able to disavow. The more complicated and specific something is, the harder it is to say you didn't know. A common dog whistle phrase that I hear all the time, and especially here in Wenatchee, grooming. Now, grooming is a real and serious issue with pedophiles and with predators who come in all shapes and sizes, as well as all backgrounds. I'm not going to minimize the seriousness of that. We should absolutely be prioritizing the safety of our children from predators. However, what makes the phrase grooming a dog whistle is how it's used to demonize people who are not predators. It's been adopted as a modern attack against the LGBTQIA2S plus community at large. It has also most recently been used in regards to teachers in our valley who are supportive of and create safe spaces for queer children in our schools. It's pretty easy to see that it's a dog whistle when all you have to do is ask how. Grooming and predatory actions are serious accusations. So the next person you hear say that a queer person or a teacher is grooming, ask them how, because it should be very straightforward. Most of the time, they won't even answer. If they do, it's going to stem from bigotry. A boy shouldn't be wearing makeup. A girl shouldn't be shaving her head. A boy shouldn't be wearing a dress and dancing like that. They are just confused. Queer people existing is not grooming. Making a TikTok about how you're happy and who you are is not grooming. Letting kids know that it's okay to be different is not grooming. Drag queens are not grooming. If this is grooming, then this, 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 and this are also grooming, along with literally every performer ever. Let's talk about actual grooming for a moment. And I mean real grooming, literally any Bible passage and pastor that says women or girls are supposed to be subservient to their husbands and parents, and that wives should give their husbands sex whether they want to or not, that's called rape. That's an endorsement of rape. There are tons of passages in the Bible about how a woman should act, dress, breed, drink, and serve to please their husband. These tenets must be followed or they may not enter heaven. The alternative being torture for all eternity. That's a threat. Predators who sexually assault children are often related to them. But no one wants to talk about that. Dog whistles are dangerous. Stoking fear and hatred means inviting violence. Because of painting the queer community with the grooming brush, we have laws that are made to supposedly protect cis, straight, white children against queer kids and adults. But all they do is further endanger them by removing queer supporting teachers who were creating safe spaces and forcing them to use bathrooms that don't align with their gender identity, which actually ends with trans children being assaulted. And even the public calling for queer executions. Mark Burns, who was running for office in South Carolina, just last month called for the arrest and execution of anyone supporting LGBTQ rights and trans children, including their parents. The LGBT transgender grooming our children's minds is a national security threat because it is ultimately designed to destabilize the republic we call the United States of America. That's why when I'm elected, I don't want to just vote. I want to start holding people accountable for treason to the Constitution. I am going to push to reenact HUAC, 
HUAC is the House of Un-American Activities Committee. It was a real committee that was formulated back in the 50s and is a, a committee that we should reenact that starts holding these people accountable for treason. We need to hold people for treason, start having some public hearings and start executing people who are found guilty for their treasonous acts against the Constitution of the United States of America, just like they did back in 1776. You know what, South Carolina? This is our guy. This is real. This isn't a game. If you see anyone using these dog whistles, you need to start pointing it out and asking them to explain what it means to you. It all starts to fall apart when they try to explain what they mean. They will say they are only looking out for children and or safety. But in reality, they just want to oppress and persecute anyone who is different from them. They want to capitalize and popularize hate speech, and they want to do it quietly without being called out for the bigots that they are. They want to eradicate anyone who doesn't align with their supposed Christian values, which we all know at this point is bullshit. Be ready for them to lash out, even violently. They do not like being called out, especially in public places like social media. Well, that's all I've got for you today. Thanks for watching. I have a really an awesome announcement about the development of a debate that I will be hosting for the 2022 general election candidates. So stay tuned. A really huge, big shout out to our patrons, Rachel P and Sarah Slay. Thank you very much. Hit that subscribe button to stay updated with us. And any sources we've used in today's episode are below or are available on our website at progressivedevilry.com.